through um, how I made a toy for Toy Fun, uh, my diver toy, and uh, some of the thought process behind it. Uh, so this is um, this is one of the first custom toys I made. Obviously, it's a uh, kid robot money, um, and uh, I think I did a few before this, but this is the first one I did like in full colour, and that uh, sort of like started to get a bit of a response from people from. And uh, as I started to sort of continue to do customising, it started to uh, become my style to include a lot of detail. Uh, like this is a good example of that. And um, uh, people sort of started to recognise my stuff for having this really intense detail and sort of uh, stuff like that. Um, but uh, it started to become a bit of a problem for me because uh, obviously it takes a long time to do. And uh, I'd really like as many people as possible to be able to buy my stuff and something that I've spent like a week painting obviously I have to charge quite a lot of money for it which is, I thought was kind of a bit of a shame. Uh, this is an, another example of a custom toy I did. Uh, this was a bit later on, it was for a, a customer in, um, in America. Um, so the whole time I was making these I was trying to think around the problem, try and come up with a way that I could still have like a real good level of detail and sort of intricacy in what I was doing but try and kind of bring the, the cost down and the, and the amount of time down a bit. And so I started looking into resin uh, casting. I'm quite aware actually that people who are into toys tend to be quite knowledgeable about the technical side of how toys are made. So you guys probably already know uh, a bit about sort of moulds and, and things like that, but I'll, I'll kind of uh, try and talk through it quickly. Um, so I, I really like this character, this diver. Um, I live on an island, I live in Guernsey in the Channel Islands and the nautical themed stuff started coming out uh, more and more in my, in my work. Uh, so I kind of chose this custom as something I wanted to develop into my own resin toy. I think that, like, if, if any of you guys are thinking of doing it, I think that's a really good way to do it. Kind of try out your ideas in custom form, and then if one of them is kind of seems suitable, you can kind of develop it into your own toy. Uh, so I came up with this little uh, blueprint. Um, I tried to make this so that it was um, that all the measurements on it were right, and, proportions were kind of right, um, sort of just as a basic shape, like a form for it. Um, obviously something you've got to be aware of when you're doing this is that it's going to be 3D eventually, so you kind of have to think a little bit about, you know, this is very flat, and you kind of have to think what these shapes are. So I kind of knew that this was like a, a tapering sort of cone uh, shape, and this was like a sphere. But that's something you kind of have to bear in mind. Uh, and the first thing I did was, uh, this is really cool, um, a really cool way to just make things and see, like I was saying before, and see what it looks like. This is insulation foam. You can buy this from probably from like B&Q and stuff like that, uh, builders, merchants, and um, you can cut it with a hot wire, um, hot wire tool. They're really cheap. I think I got mine for like 40 quid or something, and it's, it's really, really useful for, for making stuff out of foam. And uh, you can sand it afterwards. And you can also, um, if you get one of those, another you know, craft knives that you kind of push the blade out and it snaps off. If you get one of those and push the blade all the way out so it's long, because it's so thin, you can use it to carve the, uh, the foam really nicely. Um, I think uh, I didn't have a lathe at this point. I bought one later on, and these <laughs> these are actually done on the lathe. The lathe obviously spins the piece of material, and so when you sort of start to work on it, it makes it symmetrical. <laughs> what I actually did was um, I attached this to a drill, <laughs> and spun it like that with a bit of sandpaper. So it's not the most accurate way to do it, but it did work. Um, and then uh, a hot glue gun on a low setting will stick it together. If it's on a high setting, it will melt it. Um, so, yeah, oh yeah, there's a craft knife there, that, that kind of thing, the one that we sort of push the blade out. Uh, so, there it is together. Um, so, this is really useful for um, seeing what it looked like, making sure the arms would move all the way around without interfering with the body and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it just held together with double sided tape. Um, so, yeah, originally what I was going to do was um, coat that um, that foam in epoxy, which is like a kind of resin in itself. You sort of pour two parts of the material together, mix it up, and then it would harden after several hours. And I was going to paint that onto the foam and tighten, like clean that up so it was nice and smooth, and then make a mold from that. Um, but um, then I got this lathe. This is like a little Proxon mini lathe. And uh, what I ended up doing actually was just completely re rebuilding it from scratch. Um, and this is actually resin, like the exact resin that I used to pour in to the moulds to make the final piece. I just made like a block of it. Um, and this is the head, so I, I drilled a big hole in it first so that it would end up with like a, a, a slot that I could put the, um, the cylinder face into, does that make sense? 
So obviously you, you can't make a shape like that on a lathe. I mean, it's it just because it's not sort of symmetrical. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I like using a lathe rather than Sculpey because I find that all of my ideas, I always want it to be a sphere or a cylinder or something like that, and that's very hard to sculpt accurately. Um, so for me, using a lathe makes a lot more sense. Um, there's all the bits eventually, so these are all pretty much all just cylinders. There's some little uh, cone shapes there that did on the lathe and then used a disc sander to get the sort of angle on the end. Um, yeah, all kind of basic shapes. Uh, this is a, a cone, but it's kind of offset slightly. It's tilted so that the, the belly sort of comes out and forwards a bit more, just to give it a slightly sort of anthropomorphic shape. And then there's the, the master. So I have to get a mold of this so that I have that uh, kind of to, to work on. Uh, and this is one of them. I made a few sort of DIY versions, uh, which are available at my booth. Um, this, <laughs> this is all uh, held together with magnets, all the articulation points are, are magnetised. Uh, I did look into using a little peg, like you would get in a dunny or whatever, but um, there were some problems, probably not enough time to go into why that didn't work, but yeah, magnets um, seem to work fine. And for a DIY toy, it's quite cool to have it magnetised, because when you're customising something, you need to take the arms off and put them back on all the time, and it makes it very easy if they're just magnets. It's quite cool. Uh, the hands aren't on there, that's because I haven't uh, enough made them yet. Uh, yeah, what I did after this is um, going back to what I was talking about before about trying to create a product that had a lot of detail and intricacy in it. Um, my idea was to try and make the detail physically a part of the object um, so that then obviously if you make a mould, uh, just briefly in case no one knows what I'm talking about, a mould is um, a rubber thing that has a space inside it that is the same shape as your piece you want to reproduce. So, it, and usually it comes in two parts and takes the part, uh, you sort of pour the, the plastic into it, it fills up, and then it hardens, and then you can take out your, your piece. And so I wanted the design to actually be incorporated into that, so that every time I poured one, I'd be able to take it out and it would have the design on it already, instead of obviously having to paint it every time. It's extremely time consuming and uh, uh, ends up being very expensive. Now, so what I did is I took my, my DIY uh, diaper, and I used like a, um, a carving knife, like a straight carving knife, and just like gradually, instead of painting on it, just gradually scratched into it. Uh, the design I came up with eventually was uh, like a, a map. Um, you can come and see these at my, at my stand, but um, sort of uh, these riveted, uh, I don't know what you call it, these strips to make it look sort of uh, mechanical. And um, yeah, like this map design with the sort of uh, all these dotted lines that you kind of find on nautical maps on it. So that's all physically a part of it, so every time I pour into the mould it comes out and it, it has that shape. Uh, so I added a couple more things at this stage. Uh, this is uh, used, using a technique called cold casting, which is where you get your mould and before you pour in the plastic, which obviously starts as a liquid, then it hardens within uh, the mould. Um, before you do that you get some uh, sort of metallic powder and coat the inside of the mould with that so that when the resin goes in and sets, it kind of sticks to it and it holds it and it, it actually becomes physically part of the, the casting. Uh, so that's where the gold, the sort of metallic finish comes from. Uh, and I did the shoulders and hands silver just to, to give it a bit of variety. Um, and then after that, um, it kind of uh, had a very like toy-like look to it after that. It was kind of quite uniform, quite a uniform sort of finish. Which is all right, but um, I decided to like cover it with a, an ink wash. Basically, what that is, is um, I used Games Workshop ink wash, like the Warhammer miniature stuff, and it's uh, kind of a strong pigment, but in a very watery sort of uh, base. So when you paint that on, it kind of tends to settle into any grooves and any recessed areas, and stays in there. And it also uh, gives a kind of weathered sort of look, and so it kind of brings out the design that I've carved in. Uh, and I was pretty happy with that. And then the last thing I did was um, uh, this this face piece. Um, this took like quite a few tries. In fact, I I might have been casting these at midnight a couple of nights ago before I left on the plane to come here. Um, I eventually got it how I wanted, but um, I wanted it to kind of look like flame. Like the idea with this is, um, uh, well, in my imagination anyway, uh, the diver character is kind of like a sort of a sun god sort of thing. 
the idea being that the sun kind of uh, dips behind the horizon at the end of the day. And I had this idea of it being like a diver, and uh, which kind of ties in with the gold sort of uh, finish of it. And it kind of looks a bit like an astronaut, and the, the map being like an aerial view. I kind of thought there was some kind of a thing going on there. But yeah, um, so tying in with the, the sun thing, I wanted this face piece to look like flame, so there's like fire uh, kind of going on inside. And the way I did it was I got some um, Smoothcast 326, which is a specific uh, resin that sets um, translucent, um, so you can kind of see through it. And I bought some special dyes for it as well, but um, usually with the dyes, what you do is you mix the dye into one of the parts of the resin before you mix them to start the chemical reaction. And it, it comes out a uniform colour, but with this, which is the bit that took loads of time and experimentation, I had to get, get the mould or in the resin, and then the way I found worked was I got a little toothpick with a tiny little bit of the dye on the end of it and kind of stuck it into the liquid before it set and kind of moved it around. And uh, something that something about resin is that as it's setting, um, after you've mixed the two parts together, as it sets, it obviously starts a chemical reaction, quite an exotic reaction within it that, uh, that hardens it, and it heats up massively, it gets extremely hot. And one of the effects of that is if there's a, a, a bit of dye suspended within the liquid, it will create these convection currents uh, within it, which kind of spread it out really nicely. Um, another guy who does this is uh, Floor Toys. You can see him, he, he does a lot of this, kind of he'll uh, cast into a mold and then inject dye into it, and you can get some really cool effects as well. Uh, so yeah, that's how I sort of ended up doing that. Um, again, it's, it's all sort of held together with magnets, you can move it. I feel like this is, um, to me, it's an important thing for a toy actually, that it, it, it moves, that you can kind of play with it. Um, I suppose it's kind of one of, the, one of the things that differentiates a toy from being a, a sculpture of any other kind. I kind of imagine that normally a sculpture is something you go into a gallery and you look at and you can't touch it, and it's really expensive and valuable. Um, whereas a toy, I feel like it's more of a personal thing, maybe something you'd have in your home, in your own collection, than something you would handle. That's something I feel is, is important about making toys.